A very warm welcome to you, to friends of the college, to all members, and I can see some of our uh, students amongst the mix here as well. Welcome to you all. Uh, last time we did a series of talks uh, each week um, throughout the term, looking at different aspects of the pandemic, and it's um, it proved to be very popular. So we're, here we are again with another term. This is the first of our weekly discussions. Um, the format is that we have a range of speakers with us, all of them old members of Trinity, and uh, all going to give us a short introduction to different aspects of Trinity, uh, sorry, different aspects of the pandemic and its impact on the arts. And uh, do put uh, questions in the chat as we go along, and we'll take questions either during um, at, at the end of a, each individual speaker, or probably more likely, we'll hold the questions to the end. But please put your questions up as we go along, and I can field them at, at what feels like the right moment. I want to say a huge thank you to all our guests. Uh, Hilary Griffiths, our conductor, who's going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on the arts in Germany and how that's, how that's affected things. Louise Jury, Director of Communications and Marketing for Screen Skills, looking at the impact on film. Uh, we have Michael Gelater, who's going to talk about the freelance industry in theatre. Michael's a theatre director. Lara Brooker, um, an artist based in France. She's going to talk about the effect of the crisis on visual artists. Mary Janet Leaf, uh, a, a performer, will talk about the, um, the issues to do with performing uh, digitally, performing live music online. Michael Papadopoulos, who is uh, uh, a conductor, is going to talk about opera and the impact on opera and some of the rep that people are performing. Uh, John Singer is going to talk about uh, the stakeholders for the arts and entertainment industries and um, how issues have changed and some of the positive things, he tells us. Uh, Lucy Mason, Chief Executive of the Federation of Scottish Theatre, is going to talk about how it's impacted on the arts in Scotland. And I think I've got everyone there. Uh, thank you all for giving up your time. And it's great to bring you together it's terrific to have so many Trinity alumni working in the arts, she says as somebody who spent a career in the arts. Um, and I'm going to ask Hilary Griffiths to kick us off. Okay, my name is Hilary Griffiths. I read maths at Trinity, but uh, having been very active in music during my time at Oxford and before, went off to forge a career as a conductor. And I've been based in Germany for 40 years now. And although I have worked around the world, this is the area in which I have the most knowledge. We benefit in Germany from a huge arts infrastructure supported by local and central government. More full-time opera companies than the rest of the world put together, over 80, and around 130 orchestras. The result is that many musicians, singers, actors, and dancers are on permanent contracts with their obvious benefits. While many have been furloughed, the government has picked up the shortfall in wages. There is, of course, also a large private sector, smaller theatres and cabarets, chamber music and some chamber orchestras and festivals which have more or less support from the government. Freelance musicians have been having a hard time, of course. There are various schemes to help them financially, but for all performers, the greatest disaster is in not being able to perform. Theatres and orchestras have turned to the internet, streaming productions, and communicating with their audiences in a much more informal way, which has opened up various possibilities that could be implemented after the end of the pandemic. But it's not clear to what extent this has been accepted by our audiences. One of the most intractable problems has been what to do with the many subscription holders who still make up the majority of the audiences. Arts and entertainment. Arts and entertainment are at very different ends of the spectrum in the German-speaking world. It's a cliche that in Germany, opera is not expected to be enjoyed, or rather I should say you are not expected to be entertained. It is supposed to improve you, 
educate you, give you ideas and experiences that you would not otherwise have, and even experience emotions that in normal life would be forbidden. As such, it has a central importance to German life and is seen as the flagship of culture. After the destruction of the Second World War, in many cities, the first buildings to re be rebuilt were the opera houses. The Germans' love of Kultur and their hope that this would sustain them after so much of their society was demolished, led them to hold on tight to an expression of their lives that was non-political. The next crisis for the arts in Germany came with unification, when most of the money that the individual states gave to the arts was diverted to the East, and we expected that several theatres would close. This did not happen, though a few orchestras were amalgamated, especially in the East, but the era in which theatres were always full and supported by a long-standing subscription system was being eroded. And what of the crisis that will be faced after the pandemic comes under control? Germans in the state sector are pretty confident that they will return to the status quo, having learned a bit more about streaming, which they can incorporate into their future plans. Those that have lost the most are certainly those studying and those trying to take their first steps in the business. No opportunities to perform, to gain experience, even to audition. Some have already given up their dreams to be musicians. Orchestras and theatres are cutting back on all freelance workers, a time of retrenchment. Our particular world is based on the premise that a live performance has something unique and magical. That the emotional and intellectual power of the combination of theater, music, dance, and the unparalleled ability of the human voice to communicate will not lose its appeal, indeed its necessity. While I can see the spoken theater being much more flexible with its offerings, opera needs solid structures and generally financial support to exist. In the German speaking world and the countries of Eastern Europe, I believe this will continue at the high end of international opera companies, but also for the small local theaters that are supported by their towns. For me of particular concern is the lack of creativity so many of my friends and colleagues have experienced during lockdown. It's not just the inability to perform, it seems that the situation has stunted artistic development among many. Has there been a withering of the imagination generally, or is this more pronounced in a conservative regimented land like Germany? At my summer festival in Eutin in the north of Germany, we are planning a full season, but with only a third of our normal audience, half the orchestra to enable distancing in the pit and a small chorus. We hope fervently that we will be able to greet our visitors to our stage by the lake in the castle grounds, but nobody knows. Please wish us well. Hilary, thank you very much indeed. I was talking to an orchestral manager in the UK the other day who said that in the UK system for contract orchestras, that's pe people who are not self-governing orchestras, um, every time they don't perform, they save money. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain conundrum here, um, although they're all desperate to get back and perform. I'm, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, that doesn't surprise me. We're going to come to, to Michael Chilater to, to hear a little bit about the impact on freelance. Well, I... In the theatre. Yes, I, I, I'm a theatre and opera director, and I, uh, I'm based in London, but I, I, I have worked all over the place, really. Um, I remember when I was making this very hard transition from uh, assisting to doing my own work that uh, uh, an actress with an extraordinary body of work told, gave me a note just hanging there. And I remember being very frustrated at the time because I didn't know what it really meant. Of course, was now thinking in pre-pandemic terms, uh, it just all seems so easy. But what a lot of us have been doing since March last year is hanging in there, uh, you know, watching one contract postponed after another or projects cancelled or, you know, going through a range of emotions. Um, and of course, being um, 
among whatever it means to be a member of a creative team, we don't, our timing works differently than say it does for dancers, for uh, actors, for uh, opera singers. And I, I believe that I've, uh, I've been using, trying to use the, the time as productively as I can in terms of having a number of projects ready that when uh, we can perform, I already have a sort of five ideas to throw at producers or things that I could do in theatre and I'm uh, simultaneously working on operatic projects which again depend on what this or that country allows to happen but um, I, if, if there is a, a message that that I would like to pass on is exactly what that actress said to me which is hang in there and uh, you know the, the lucky us the lucky ones of us who are mid-career uh, we already have a body of work and we just need to return to it uh, I think it must be an extremely hard time for the beginners in any field, whether it's performance or whether it's being any member of any form of creative team in theatre and in opera, because you haven't proven yourself and there are absolutely no opportunities to do it. And you have to go through the whole mill of meeting people, networking, um, like, for example, uh, there used to be a couple of clubs for uh, for the creative, so to speak, in, in the West End, which one would use for meetings and uh, hate the word networking, but basically meeting um, among the creatives and both have closed down. So at the moment, I don't, don't quite know what it's going to be like if you need to say meet up with your designer or your lighting designer and discuss a project, uh, let alone the uh, I'm, I'm a holder of three passports, so uh, Brexit will not affect me too badly. But uh, the other thing is, of course, all the visa issues and the number of days that you, you know you can spend. And rehearsal periods can take two, two months, sometimes three months, as you all know. But uh, I really, really hope that the, the young people from Trinity, the graduates that uh, are hoping to enter the the arts will find a way of hanging in there. We will wake up from this nightmare one day. Uh, of course, I want my life back as it was. I don't think any of us are going to get our lives back as those lives were, but whatever the new normality is, uh, just hang in there and uh, and uh, persevere. And I can imagine how hard it, it must be if you haven't proven yourself or if you don't have any um, body of work to to say um, bring to the table but uh, uh, I think we need we all need this philosophical patience for for all of us to get the jab and then just move on with our lives so uh, I wish everybody all the best and I hope uh, that we'll feel safe on stage we'll feel safe in the auditorium sooner than we think and I'm keeping my fingers crossed for everyone. That's it from me. Michael, thank you. You've both mentioned younger artists and our next speaker graduated from Trinity in 2009 in music, Michael Papadopoulos, who's also working in opera. Michael, tell us about your perspective. Hi everyone. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here and it's a huge pleasure actually to be among such distinguished panel members and it's you know you think of Trinity you don't necessarily think of it as a, a musical college necessarily but actually seeing all these amazing alumni here proves me wrong and it's so great to be here so thank you. Um, just very briefly following on from what uh, Michael said there I just thought I'd very quickly share my perspective as someone who's breaking into the profession before talking about the sort of uh, music that's been performed in opera houses uh, that has been performed over the last few months um, and just to echo what Michael said really it's been really tough uh, because you're at the stage of your career where you're really wanting to make the most out of opportunities and to show to people what you can do and as you're about to sort of unleash that energy the opportunities seem to be taken away um, now I'm, I'm in a really fortunate position because I 
recently started on the Young Artist Programme at the Royal Opera House in London. Uh, and as such, I, I think I'm one of the very few people doing what I do at this stage of my career in the UK to have a sort of, uh, it's a two year contract on, on the payroll. Uh, so that's been an absolute godsend, but a lot of my colleagues have really been struggling. Uh, lots of people have actually left the profession entirely, uh, which is absolutely heartbreaking. And you put so much work and effort to acquire the skills, to get knowledge, years and years and years of training way beyond your undergraduate. Uh, to see that thrown away is absolutely tragic. But the, uh, the sort of positivity, uh, this idea of hanging on is so important. And I think uh, hopefully before long, uh, we'll get there. So uh, I thought actually I would briefly reflect on what I consider to be one of the more positive innovations uh, in opera since March last year. And to do so, because I'm one of the younger members, I need to do it with a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm just gonna try and share my screen and hope I don't get any embarrassing emails uh, while I do so. Uh, can you see this slightly off yellow background? Great, fantastic. So during the past year, opera has not only faced a financial crisis, it's faced a huge existential crisis. During the past 11 months, opera, like so many other disciplines, has had to fight to survive, and in doing so has proven to be an art form that is unbelievably resilient, innovative, and adaptable. As a result, the question I've often asked myself recently has been, what makes opera, opera? When we think of opera, we probably imagine something like this. We have lavish costumes and sets, dozens and dozens of performers on stage, maybe 80 orchestral players in the pit, and perhaps the same number again backstage in various capacities. Now, of course, not every opera looks like this, but opera tends to be associated with the idea of a grand spectacle. At the very least, you would expect several singers on stage with a set of some description. But could opera look like something else, something more intimate? Could it look like this? Here we have only one or two people on stage at any given time. There are costumes and a few props, but barely anything in the way of a set, only some clever lighting and stage effects. You can't see from these pictures but there is actually a reduced orchestra of maybe 20 players in the pit, all socially distanced, as are the artists on stage. A far cry from the 80 plus players required for a performance of a Diva Cura. All of this on a stage designed to accommodate shows of an infinitely larger and more complex nature. These pictures are from a rare night of live opera at the Royal Opera House uh, in October last year, in which four works, none of which individually could be traditionally described as opera, were performed on the main stage with a reduced orchestra and to a live audience of around 900, as well as being live streamed. Now, these are works that normally wouldn't be seen on the Royal Opera's main stage, which is more accustomed to the likes of Bohème, Traviata or Carmen. But one of the few pleasures of this past year has been the spotlight that's been placed on lesser known, smaller scale works. These are often pieces that are too small for operatic main stages and too large or even too niche for regular concert performance. I'm thinking of monodramas, secular or even sacred cantatas, concert arias, and many more. They were not conceived as operas. They were almost certainly not even written for the stage, but they are certainly operatic. This is a sort of sugar-free diet opera, the operatic form stripped to its bones, not extravagant, but intimate, bare, compact, and real. Performances of smaller works such as these have become more and more commonplace in the UK and probably around the world over the last year. While some companies have instead opted for chamber arrangements of more traditional operatic repertoire, I think the celebration of these rarer gems is a more worthwhile investment for the opera community and ultimately results in both a more satisfying audience experience and acts as a sort of diversification of a canon that has remained largely unchanged and unchallenged for decades. That's a conversation for another time. So back to the question, what makes opera opera? It's a fascinating question with no clear single answer, but I think it's more than just a label assigned to works of a certain length, size and form. 
And ultimately it boils down to the essential premise of characters telling a story as vividly as possible through music and theater. This applies even if a piece requires one singer, a dozen instrumentalists and lasts no more than a quarter of an hour. I mentioned before that opera is adaptable and I think we have seen that more clearly than ever over the past months. So when audiences are eventually allowed back into our theatres and we have fewer and fewer restrictions on what is allowed on stage and off, what sort of opera can we expect to see? Was this last year merely a novel but ultimately temporary necessity? I'm hopeful that opera bosses will have seen the potential in this neglected repertoire and the incredible results when it's afforded the same reverence as opera's more traditional war horses and is performed also to the highest level on the world's greatest stages. Opera on a grand scale is undoubtedly one of the most exhilarating experiences out there. And of course I miss it terribly and I can't wait for it to return. Also the reality is that opera's greatest hits will be guaranteed box office successes, something that can't be taken for granted post COVID. But operatic repertoire on a smaller scale, not necessarily on a smaller stage, achieves something else. It allows the art form to express itself in a more subtle and concise way. It allows for works that were not written for the stage to be seen through a new lens. It allows the art form, uh, it, re it reduces the art form to its absolute essence. And whilst it demands an extraordinary amount from its singers, perhaps even more so than in regular opera, the payoff can be astronomical. I really hope once the pandemic is over, we'll continue to see international houses championing these works, not because they have to, but because this sort of innovative programming will help keep opera vibrant and alive. But more than that, it will remind us that opera, which is so often associated with large scale extravagance, is nothing more than storytelling, storytelling and vibrating vocal folds. This is what makes opera so versatile. And this is for me, what makes opera, opera. All of this is not to suggest that opera companies need to radically rethink how they plan their seasons, but I do genuinely think there is an appetite for the sort of repertoire I've described and the pandemic has shown that. Not just at the UK's fantastic fringe festivals or smaller companies, but on our international stages. What better way to attract potential newcomers who might find it hard to sit through four hours of Wagner, but for whom a sort of potpourri evening of miniatures might just convince them that this art form is rather special. I will just end by saying that this past year has really brought me closer to what opera is all about. But above that, it's shown that this beautiful, extraordinary art form will survive no matter what form it's forced to assume. So thank you very much. And here's to getting back into our theatres sooner rather than later. Oh, I need to, how do I get rid of this? Stop, no. Ah, close. Can you... Many, many thanks. thanks for back. Michael, um, just a quick question from me. When you did your short operas and you talked about the audience in the opera house, do you have any idea of your reach through digital? Uh, I think I'm a little bit too far down in the food chain to have a precise answer about that. Uh, but I'm sure it, it was tens of thousands it reached. And actually that's one of the fantastic, I mean, streaming is problematic as well, but one of the fantastic benefits is that you reach a significantly wider audience than you otherwise would. So I, I definitely think that going forward, streaming, especially in houses that can easily accommodate it, will become a more regular fixture. Thank you. Uh, we're starting to get some questions through. I'm going to hold them until we've been through a few more speakers. So delighted now to introduce John Singer, uh, who's worn many, many hats across the art sector. John. Hi. Well, lovely to see everybody on on the call. Um, I was um, I'm, I'm a relic from 1969, so I do not have slides. Uh, but Michael, you've given me a wonderful segue in because what what you are starting to say about opera it it, it it resonates with what I hope I'm going to try to leave as a positive message. Um, I have to explain. I suppose I, I I did leave Trinity. I went through a financial life ending with 25 years of running um, one of the largest global private equity funds. And it was music and the arts that kept my sanity going. So I actually I left and more or less in 1975, uh, joined Rombert, uh, Rombert Dance, uh, was there for 25 years and have done a whole variety of every form of 
performing, non-performing arts. And I myself uh, played the piano. I was a horn player. I um, built my own harpsichord, which I play. I took up conducting five years ago. And these are going on the side. And it's really my observations I'd just like to share this evening with you from a variety of, of points of view. How does one survive? Assuming that you get sort of uh, enough money from the cultural, from the crisis relief funds and what have you to survive. And the message I really want to say is what I have found is that there have always been shifts in what our stakeholders are expecting. And it is the insensitivity to those which will lead to disaster. And it is the sensitivity and the ability to change which gives massive opportunity. I, I, I'm so excited about the arts in the next 20, 25 years, if we can just get over this hurdle and if enough people are sensitive to the need to change. And this is true, you know, it, 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 um, COVID has merely accelerated trends and, and um, everyone talks about it as being the thing that has determined. It has not. There's, those shifts have been going on. I'll give you some examples of those shifts to try to, to, to demonstrate what I mean. But the crucial thing is that unless you have a monopoly, the winners are those who adapt to the needs of today. And that's what we've got to do. Instead of just putting out a begging bowl, which all the other, I mean, the, the theater, everyone has written wonderful letters to Rishi saying, save us, save us. That's not enough. What are we gonna do to save ourselves? So basically, um, you know, the, I, I think I, I've had the misfortune or bad luck to have to lead four strategic plans in January. Um, the National Gallery, where I am sort of uh, a trustee, but I am chairman of development and basically run the strategy and, and, and very involved. And there, it's, it's not a matter of changing the platform, it's how you use that platform. So I have to be a little bit discreet here, uh, uh, a bit indiscreet. Um, and then what you will find when it finally gets announced is that after 200 years of being an ingrown toenail and basically concentrating on the great news that 6.3 million visitors come to the National Gallery um, every year, we're now saying, well, no, we should be externally focused. This has been my great sort of, you know, challenge to write, say no, for nation, for international, and, you know, let's think outside the gallery. Um, that was on Thursday. On Wednesday, I chair the National Youth Orchestra, and there the change has been, with Sarah as a wonderful CEO, has been to say, no, we're not just, the Daily Telegraph calls us the best teenage orchestra in the world, open to, uh, to, 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 to discussion, but that isn't what we're there for. We are there to put teenagers at the center of voice, the, and to basically to, to attract those who have no knowledge about music, but also to bring in sort of cultural attitudes, leadership, and, 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 and that are important in society today. Um, Two weeks ago was the City of London Sinfonia, which I chair, and there again, to take that platform, which has taken me as chairman 10 years to create, which is to sort of get um, participation, social impact work, instead of being something on the side, which I found it, it now determines everything that we do on the stage, including events and concerts. And we just won the Royal Philharmonic Society Award for doing, for, for social impact and runners up for ensemble for the types of activity, which is basically intercommunicating it's two ways it's no longer that one where you know you sit there passively and we direct something at you no this is now sharing this is now um opening up to society uh which we which we all need to do um and you know these are just some examples i could i, I won't bore you but basically what i really want to say is that um you know we do have to change so what lies behind those shifts and i just wrote down um some things at a macro level and then for the sector. And would you may agree or disagree with these trends, but these are trends that I feel we all have to think about, whatever, in business too, it's, it's no different. We have to sort of think about these changes. So he, here we go, macro level. Number one, the growing importance of impact on society and relevance of any cultural or business organization's actions. Two, the enormous positive endorsement we are finding now, not just from youth, from everyone, for health and well-being the environment, climate issues, with a growing spotlight on mental health. Thirdly, a continuing move away from perceived elitism, doesn't matter whether it is elitism, perceived to a broader definition of self-justification. Fourthly, a growing emphasis on the what and why we do things, the output, 
rather than focus just on the methodology. Trust and foundations now, for the first time, are moving away from the how to the what and actually funding core costs. Great news for all the arts. Fifthly, the search for personal fulfillment beyond doing a job and feeling part of something and society. Sixthly, a move from token to sustained equality, diversity, and inclusion. This is not a box to tick to get your Arts Council grant. How do we actually really do this? An ever-growing reliance on partnerships. Opera, yeah, I mean, it's beyond sharing productions, which is good. We've got to be much wider and, and, and cross-dressing in its wider sense, which I'm a great advocate of um, in this sense. The wealthy are becoming wealthier, but their generosity is not growing at the same rate in the UK. Charities Art Foundation, um, basically 25% of giving to medical, 24% to animals, and less than 1% to culture. So then arts and culture sector, coming to the next level, establishing the link between the arts and how they add value to and improve communities and society beyond the stage or gallery. You know, really sort of think that through. It, and, and, and for our musicians too, you know, they enjoy that too. Surviving and returning to public audiences and exposure, but on the basis of improved financial and audience development models. Establishing harder data to show how the arts can transform societies and the individual's health and well-being. How to deliver effectively at all levels on equality, diversity, and inclusion. And of course, attract a far greater share of philanthropic giving. And I make life more satisfying in a bigger sense for all our performers. And, you know, close friend to give it, operatic world, Michael, uh, Joyce did an art who is a very close friend of ours. And she, for her, singing on the stage is, of course, her life. But going into Sing Sing prison in New York and actually now getting one of the prisoners on death row to write an opera, um, you know, has really, that is for her as satisfying as, as anything. So to finish, let me just say, we have a choice. We can be Oliver Twist. We can go out with a begging bowl, go back to Rishi, who I know from personal conversations and is absolutely fed up of it, you know, and we can just dream of returning to as was. Or we can try to be positive and to create a new strategic operational and financial models. I chaired, I was asked to set up at the Association of British Orchestras, a conference for conductors, uh, for, yes, sorry, not sorry, for orchestras, um, chairman and trustees. And the second half was devoted to this, what I introduced as, as was versus change. And I think it's fair to say it was depressing and it's particularly opera and large orchestras who are desperate not to have to change the tanker. I've had endless conversations, Michael, with Alex Beard and, you know, and, and we're no doubt we'll have many, many more. And hope it, their new chairman, David Ross, may change this. But you've got there the example of, you know, no change and, and all operatic. And we were hearing about Germany and Hillary, you know, I, I, I know so many of those. And, you know, and, and it's, it's really um, difficult. Change. Whereas there are so many nimble orchestras, so many nimble uh, artists who are sort of trying to find the new models. And I find that that is what is going to be exciting. That's going to drive us forward. And I think, therefore, this is a critical time. We have to survive. I'm not underplaying. And, you know, City of London Sinfonia had zero reserves. I went in with three weeks, you know, into, into, into lockdown. Um, but I'm really confident um, about the future because we're changing. So I just want to leave a positive message. But, of course, the condition is you do actually have to do something about it. Don't just think it's all going to go back and we just have to get some money just to get us over the next few months. No, we don't. We really have to make ourselves better adapted to a world that's been changing for five years, 10 years, not because of COVID. Thank you, Hilary. John, thank you. Lots to think about there um, and lots of ideas which will both divide and unite um, across our, our spectrum here. Many thanks indeed. Um, I'm going to pass on to Mary Janet, a, a performer, uh, who is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, working, performing live and digitally, um, which is what so many organisations have done in particular, um, I'd have thought, throughout COVID. Mary Janet. 
Thank you, Hilary. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on the panel today. Um, I'm MJ. I'm a specialist in historically informed musical performance and research, and I'm also doing a doctorate at the moment um, in the field of Scottish early music. Um, those of you who were at Trinity uh, around 2006 to 11 might remember I was quite involved in music at Trinity. I was president of the Music Society, sung in the choir, orchestra, etc. Um, but like Hilary, I didn't study music. I actually studied ancient history. Um, but after having uh, spent a couple of years uh, sort of resisting it, I did decide to follow my dream to become a professional recorder player. And so then I uh, studied at the Royal College of Music um, in London on a master's and since then I've been performing throughout the UK and Europe um, with my own early music group, Ensemble Hesperie. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the opportunities and the challenges of performing online during the pandemic um, through the lens of my own experience. Like Michael, I'm very much an emerging artist um, who has been hanging in there <laughs> for the past year. And I have seen countless colleagues desperate, unable to get hardship grants, unable to pay their rent and leaving the profession. Um, so it's really quite tough out here. <laughs> um, when the pandemic hit, actually, um, we were looking forward to a number of concerts at summer festivals last year, and we were preparing for our first commercial CD. Um, my ensemble had received Arts Council funding for a tour, and this had led to all sorts of fantastic bookings um, with regular appearances on the BBC and Classic FM. But when um, lockdown announced, we were actually in a Snape Maltings residence um, as Britain peers and artists and we got one day into it and then were sent back home again <laughs> and in fact that residency still hasn't been able to take place um, and over the next few months of course all concerts were cancelled um, or postponed and now they're being postponed once more so that's the uh, that's the negative part of the story um, we had to do something it became really obvious that we couldn't make music together for some time um, and members of our ensemble are either clinically vulnerable themselves or have family members um, so it wasn't reasonable to ask people to travel um, for some time and um, at the start of the pandemic Tom who's our harpsichordist and also conveniently my, uh, my husband um, we were in the middle of a residency at a care home so we performed for live music now that a wonderful charity and we were going into care homes um, taking our instruments in and leading musical sessions with the residents and this was a long uh, a sort of a long residency of three months we switched online immediately and we started um, delivering these interactive music sessions on zoom um, which threw us right into the into the technological challenges straight away um, so we decided to go the whole hog and we started our own concert series from home um, we performed every lunchtime for 18 weeks from March to July last year and then we also have a new series starting just a few weeks ago. Um, as an ensemble we recorded lots of split screen videos I'm sure that you saw on your uh, social media timelines and on the internet all these different videos um, with huge numbers of musicians. Um, this is exciting but incredibly labor intensive intensive and um, most of the larger ones you'll have seen will have had a dedicated person putting them together i taught myself how to do that um using software and it was quite a long and um well ultimately fantastic process and i'm very glad i did it but um yeah there we go this kept me very busy um and it was really a very special experience starting to live music online um, in our weekly concerts, we built up a completely new following across the globe with viewers in Australia, Uzbekistan, Sweden, America, Brazil, um, who, of course, we had never, you know, had never heard of us and we'd never heard of them previously. Um, and all their positivity and goodwill kept us going and has really helped us to hang in there. And we enjoy hearing about their lives and their difficulties and challenges um, during the pandemic as well. And they also donated very generously to us, um, although we didn't charge ticket prices, uh, tickets for any of these concerts. Um, so sometimes, however, it becomes difficult to know quite where to go now. Um, performing online is draining, very draining. And the main jo joy of music is in the communication and that relationships which you have with the audience you see us you know the pleasure on an audience member's face you see their smile you hear the applause and that spurs you on and creates an essential connection which you simply can't reproduce online um, no matter how much you know that you have an audience 
playing to an empty room or to an empty church is really strange and you never quite get used to it. Um, you're also, in the case of musicians performing from their living rooms, worrying about your technology while you're performing. And this means that you're never really focused on it. So you feel often that your performance is compromised. Um, in practical terms, and this is a really sort of the nub of the point recently where people have started to get quite, um, there have been a, a lot of uh, petitions, etc. relating to this, it's quite difficult to get paid um, in this kind of setup. If you want to ticket online concerts, you really need to be an organisation because you need licences, quite excellent equipment, um, and the capital required when most musicians are already struggling has usually been a bit prohibitive. We were lucky to have a little mic that worked, but, you know, it's, um, not everyone was able to do this. Um, so we've really enjoyed exploring this as a musical medium, and we certainly would love to to include it in our future plans, but it's not sustainable as a reliable source of income at the moment. Um, but it's definitely here to stay. Um, and we intend to stick with it as one of the many ways we can reach new audiences as part of a wider spectrum of what we do. Um, I've just purchased a new computer specifically for video editing and I'm looking forward to kind of producing teaser videos, recorded concerts, trailers, and all this kind of thing um, to, you know, to keep on with our online presence. Um, this is interesting because actually it's a bit easier for emerging musicians. We have, we can afford to experiment. No one is going to notice if we do a sort of dud concert on a Wednesday lunchtime online. Um, but for more established individuals and groups, it, it's really quite challenging. Um, and they risk losing momentum in this kind of fast paced um, world that we have at the moment. Some people also believe that we shouldn't provide uh, music free online. Um, as a matter of principle, as it will train audiences out of the habit of paying for music. I don't agree with this myself. I don't think we're really in danger of that. Um, I did one concert in October last year and audiences flooded back in despite social di uh, distancing and they really, it's not the same thing we're dealing with. Um, but when it co comes to creating high level musical content that people are prepared to pay for online, um, you know, we do have to make sure that the musicians involved are appropriately rewarded and that it's actually worth doing. In the end though, I think this balance of live and online performances will probably benefit musicians and audiences and will really contribute to a more diverse and perhaps less insular classical music world. Thank you. Mary Janet, thank you. I'm going to depart from our order just very briefly uh, because we have one music student from our current uh, music uh, undergraduates here, Tristan Weems, our organ scholar. And I thought, Tristan, you've heard quite a lot about this, and I see you nodding your head <laughs> um, throughout Janet, Mary Janet's piece. Could you tell us just in a couple of minutes only, you're not getting six, but in a couple of minutes only, um, what you've been doing with the chapel choir? Yeah, of course. Um, so many of you might um, have seen uh, and quite especially earlier on in lockdown around March and April last year, that a lot of choir did uh, these virtual choir things or multi-track recordings that uh, Mary Janet was talking about. Um, and basically, uh, in a similar way to Mary Janet, um, I taught myself how to mix and edit all these tracks and uh, it's a bit of a steep learning curve, but it was a lot of fun and it's a really good skill um, to now have. And so what we've been doing is that uh, we've got the choir, which um, as it has been for as long as I've known about it, um, is completely unauditioned. And we just ask people to, to sing along um, to this to a recording to a piece of music um, and just record themselves singing. And then I mix it together, um, sort of, which, you know, is a lot of fun. Um, uh, and then we put it out on the college's website on the sort of the virtual page, brand new college website, um, which has been a really good way of a, keeping the music kind of going, B, kind of keeping that still sort of social element of music because we have weekly socials as well. Um, and C, just having sort of a bit of musical output and a bit of still having that connection to college and to music in a time when loads of people have felt really sort of isolated and alone. Um, and that's been a real joy to do. And actually out of it, we've, um, we've released two albums, one uh, in the summer and one at Christmas um, of music that we've recorded virtually, which has been just amazing to do and it. Tristan, many thanks indeed, um, and I hope you'll make your, you have a question about networking, but I think tonight is a very important networking moment for you, and we'll take your question later on. So we've had a lot about the music, 
industry. Um, and I'm going to introduce Louise Dury now to talk about film. Hello. Um, yes, and the screen industries more generally. Um, I was previously a journalist, um, latterly covering the arts and media, and left about five years ago uh, to join an advocacy body called the Creative Industries Federation. So I have quite a broad perspective across the sector, but for the last three years, I've been working in the screen industries as director of communications for Screen Skills, which is the skills charity for behind the camera roles in film, television, animation, visual effects and games. So not working in the screen industries, but working very closely with them. Um, as we say at Screen Skills, you can't make great film, television, animation without the people. So um, the impact when the pandemic struck um, was obviously dramatic. Um, film and high-end television, that's the big you know, prime time TV costing at least a million pounds an hour to make, pretty much stopped production. Um, you know, when lockdown was first in introduced, it was estimated that about 426 million pounds worth of production was suspended at that time. Yet obviously you'll have noticed that television and streaming didn't stop. Um, there was incredible inventiveness as other people have spoken about here. You know, shows were produced from people's bedrooms and sheds. You know, Ranganathan was made from a temporary studio in his garage. You know, sports and news programmes incorporated new and emerging technology. And I'll, I'll come on to tech in a bit. Um, and a lot of work went in to supporting a safe return more generally as swiftly as possible. Uh, and we, it has to be said, we were very much helped as a sector by government um, because the government was very willing to work um, with film and television because quite frankly, the economic value of inward investment is now quite considerable um, alongside obviously the, the soft power and, and other factors. Um, so there was, for example, um, in, in film and television, action from government to help resolve issues over production insurance, for example. And until very recently, um, you know, there were quarantine exemptions for star talent coming into the UK, all of which helped. Um, but, you know, going back to what John was saying about actually taking action ourselves, you know, uh, also industry did step up. So a whole suite of guidance on operating safely was produced um, very quickly. Um, for all areas and all scales of film and television production. And um, at Screen Skills, for example, we scrambled some online learning that we launched um, by June last year. Uh, I mean, in many ways, it was very basic stuff. It explored all the rules we've come to take for granted on social distancing and hand washing and, and so forth in the context of a set or lo location. But it was the kind of thing that actually reassured government that when it was sort of doing its bit on the insurance side, um, that, uh, that, that we were trying to help ourselves. And I suppose in many ways that meant that production recommenced much quicker than perhaps many people product, uh, predicted. Um, I mean, it's thought that up to about 85% of production was back by the end of the summer. I mean, it's more expensive. Uh, it's adding anything between an estimated eight and 30% to budgets. But for example, at the moment we, you know, ourselves are working with about 75 high-end television productions across the country, which is, which is quite a lot. So although production spend is obviously very much down on the year before, um, and it, it isn't going to be the record year that everybody expected, um, uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2020 to 21, things are looking much stronger than they might have been. And so compared with what's happened in, you know, theatres and concert halls and museums and galleries, yeah. Um, it, it, it's a much stronger picture, but there are obviously question marks and some worrying factors, um, as well as some interesting things, I think. You know, obviously the closure of cinemas has raised questions about what will happen to the cinema going experience. Um, and there's a bit of a chicken and egg conundrum there. You know, the expense of making something like a James Bond really does mean that you need a big international release to recoup. So delaying um, release makes sense, except that you're not going to encourage audiences to return without good things to go and see. So that might take time. But I suppose one of the things for, for uh, this sector is that the pandemic definitely showed there was a massive public appetite. You know, um, more of that might have been consumed on televisions and tablets and mobiles for the time being, but the appetite was enormous. And, you know, both traditional broadcasters and the near streamers have seen strong figures. So it will be interesting to see what happens there post COVID. Um, 
I think there are lots of implications for the future. I'm just going to mention a couple. Um, you know, one of them is about changes to working practices and which, which are likely to be, you know, permanently adopted. So one interesting area we're looking at at the moment is implications for disabled talent. You know, obviously in, a, in, a, in an industry where, you know, the core of it is production, um, what has been interesting is how much work um, has been done in terms of prep from home. And, you know, like everybody, um, film and television has been working out how much you can do on Zoom and Microsoft Teams. And I suppose what's become clear is that there might be more scope for this than had been envisaged before. And that might have positive implications for a whole range of people, including disabled talent, um, for example. And as I mentioned, the pandemic encouraged innovation. I mean, some of it was quite basic, actually, but, but also take up of technologies that were already in use, but may become more so. Um, you know, we're very conscious that a lot more people have been looking at virtual production, which was already very commonplace in games. Um, uh, it, it's where instead of adding a whole load of visual effects after filming in post-production, virtual production involves capturing real-time uh, visual effects actually during a live action shoot. Um, and tech's always evolving, but you know, what, what will be interesting is, is what will happen to that and whether certain things will become more mainstream quicker. Uh, and I suppose there is a question um, more generally, I think about you know, the impact of, um, of COVID, about what's going to happen to the nature of employment in the UK. And, and where there are jobs. And I suppose that's interesting to us because as a sector um, and as a fastly growing sector, we've already got skills gaps and shortages. And so at Screen Skills, for example, in my day job, we're trying to build a more inclusive workforce, but there's also a very simple bottom line need for more people um, in film and, and television and the screen industries. You know, so we were, you know, for example, we're running skills transfer programs for people from other sectors. Um, we were already doing it with, for example, armed forces veterans and supporting them to move into logistics and marshalling. There are a lot of ex-army folk who, who work as location managers. But the impact on the pandemic on other sectors means we'll probably be doing more of those. So, for example, with support from the Department for Work and Pensions, we're currently working with people in aviation who are losing their jobs due to the pandemic, but might have skills that we need in the screen industries. Um, so, you know, people um, and skill shortages are really a major issue for the screen industries right now. And, and there may be things that come out of the pandemic that, that will, have, um, uh, will, will help us to tackle it, quite frankly. Um, for a long time, a shortage of studio space was the issue in the screen industries, but a, a lot has been done to address that. There are more than 50 new stages coming on uh, tap or being built in and around London, you know, Pinewood, Shepparton, Barking and Dagenham, plus investment elsewhere, you know, new announcement from Bristol last week, and, and they need crews. Um, and I suppose I, I'm going to be the, you know, I, I fear I've got to come to this thing. Uh, and people were already an issue because of Brexit. You know, Brexit had already increased the pressure in some areas. You know, at least one in three workers in visual effects um, are from Europe and as many as half in some of the big companies. So, you know, one of the reasons they came here is because we're very good at this stuff and, and we've built a real expertise um, and those people won't leave straight away, but they're likely to in time. So, you know, that nature of employment and where the jobs are, I think, will be interesting for the economy as a whole and certainly for the creative industries. Um, uh, you know, there are some estimates at the moment that the screen industries need a possible 30,000 additional people in the next few years. Um, there's a prediction that inward investment will be six billion by around 2024. So that's a challenge, but it's a good one. Um, I mean, the pandemic did highlight the vulnerability in a workforce with high numbers of freelancers and, and the plight of freelancers has already been mentioned. You know, many have been left without financial assistance during the pandemic and that's been dreadful. Um, so I think the way freelancers are treated has come onto this industry's agenda during lockdown. Um, and uh, I think more will be done um, post the pandemic to think about um, working practices and how people are treated and so forth. But I suppose, um, uh, again, to try and inject something positive into what has been a dreadful year for, for everybody, I think, is that it is a, se a sector 
um, the, the film and television industries are uh, industries that people want to join and, and there are opportunities. Um, uh, so on that positive note, I'll, I'll stop chiming. Many thanks indeed. We've got two, again, two different sectors for our final two talks. Lucy, um, I'm going to hand over to you. Lucy's in the theatre sector in Scotland. Um, and tell us how it feels north of the border. Hello. Um, thank you, Hilary. Um, yeah, I, I left Trinity in um, 1984. Um, I studied English, but I was very active as a, as a musician during my time there. And I've worked in the performing arts in management and leadership roles pretty much ever since then, um, moving to Edinburgh in uh, 1995, and have been working as a producer and a, a manager for a variety of different organisations um, since that time. And I'm, I'm currently in a post with a, an, another advocacy body, actually, the Federation of Scottish Theatre, which is a membership organisation representing about 200 individuals and organizations who work across dance, theater and, and opera. And I'm gonna talk about the, the situation in Scotland because that's what I'm living, but I, I mean, it's not, it, it's nuanced in its difference with other nations of the UK, but essentially the impact has, has, of, as has already been said is pretty similar. Um, so since March, 2020, the majority of our members have not worked at all. Um, our theatres have been closed. There was a very small window in November last year when four of our member venues were able to open, but the capacity was capped at 100. Um, many of our freelancers have considered leaving the profession altogether. I'm not going to dwell on the freelancers because that's already been covered, but it's um, one in three was our uh, survey return. Um, but also there's been an, an enormous number of staff at venues who've lost their jobs. and a lot of venues who were previously very reliant on their earned income from ticket sales and merchandising um, have survived this long through a combination of government support, UK government support and Scottish government emergency funding back in last summer, um, are facing another financial cliff edge come the end of this financial year with no prospect of any commitment to funding beyond the 1st of April. Um, so it's not a pretty sight, unfortunately. People are exhausted, they're despondent, and they're very anxious. Um, and as has been said, as one of the first industries to close our doors to the public, we're very likely to be one of the last to reopen. Um, for a sector that's predicated on sharing a live, creative and interactive experience with individuals, this is a really sad prospect. The Scottish Government has taken a very, a very cautious approach to managing public health and we completely respect this approach. And as one of the most heavily regulated and safety conscious businesses, none of our members would want the members of the public, their creative teams or their staff to be put in any danger. But I think what has dwindled over the last year and, and as the emergency continues, what, what really is, is lacking is hope actually. And harking back to what John was saying, also the optimism that might have been there for change has now been lost as people have lost the energy to make something positive come from this drastic change to our working lives. Um, so what have we learned from the last year? I, I, I think it's really, I suppose, a really obvious thing and it harks back to what Louise was saying that people in lockdown have feasted on culture. Um, and I suppose, I, I think it's interesting that actually whether or not people realise whether they're watching Doctor Who or Call the Midwife or His Dark Materials or The Game of Thrones, they're actually supporting Scottish creative talent, writers and actors who've learned their trade on the stages in Scotland and continue to work in Scotland in theatre. Um, and that we know that culture is valued um, and that we would miss it if it wasn't there, particularly now distracting us from, um, you know, the, the crisis that we're living through. Um, Work online has brought in new audiences. Um, 16 million people viewed the National Theatre of Scotland series of short plays, um, lockdown short plays last year. And with the best will in the world, I know from having been chief executive of the National Theatre of Scotland, um, they wouldn't usually attract live audiences of that scale in a season. Um, and of course, we've learned that our creative artists are enterprising and very resilient. They've made work in Scotland on beaches, in castles, on the streets, in dance studios, in empty auditoria and in venue foyers. And they've shared work online with children in schools and with old and vulnerable people in care homes. And dancers have been 
putting classes online, tapping in literally to a need for us to stay active and inventive during the hardest of times. Sorry, I'm losing my voice slightly. Um, however, we've also been reminded of the fragility of our sector. And I, I hear what John says, but I do think that the years of underfunding has exposed the cracks that we usually manage to gloss over with hard work and excellent management and brilliant artistry. Um, we've become very reliant on very limited, if any, financial reserves, and our ability to withstand the financial crisis is minimal. And we have had the inequalities of our profession laid bare. An industry that works without sufficient resources will struggle to sustain the quality of access to its opportunities and to provide the training and support required to ensure that a diverse workforce can enter but critically stay within the profession. And we've discovered that online work is a fantastic new resource and it does open doors for many audiences to engage with culture, many for the first time. But for others, and particularly in Scotland's rural communities and disadvantaged urban communities, digital access is not available. And many of our artists and organisations have lost vital and long um, standing relationships with their local communities, and some of these ties may be broken forever. So where is the good news? What are the prospects for the future? Um, I have a few hopes. Well, I have many hopes. I'm just going to share a few with you. Um, that the value of theatre and dance will be recognised and that proper investment will enable our artists and organisation to play a true and vital part of the cultural and economic and wellbeing recovery, not just of Scotland, but of the UK as a whole. And that the international prestige of our dance and theatre artists will be achieved without the need to get back onto aeroplanes and that we'll come to value the local and the intimate as markers of creative success as highly as global touring. And that this will reset the enormous carbon footprint that our sector has made in the past and that a more environmentally sustainable industry will emerge. And that also that we in, in acknowledge the inherent racism and the privilege of our industry, which does limit access to achieving a truly diverse workforce and a diverse audience. In the meantime, that's kind of post COVID, you know, the pandemic does continue. And I anticipate that we're likely to encounter productions involving much slower rehearsals. I was in uh, the recording of a, of a rehearsal in September and it's just everything takes a lot longer you have to allow the safety guidance as Louise says 48 hours if somebody touches a prop or a costume you have to wait for 48 hours the actors have to move their own furniture um, and do their own fittings and everybody has to remain socially distanced. This is a real challenge for dance artists and choreographers where touch and the, the dynamic of movement between bodies is integral there's been a few bubbles going on, but I don't know how realistic that is longer term. And it's hard to know if you have a family, can you also bubble with a dance company? There are a lot of practicalities that need to be worked through. And if people are anxious, and I think this is a particular concern for um, freelancers, if you're offered work, can you say no when you need the money, but you may not want to travel and travel at the moment is prohibited. So all of these things are very complicated. Um, I think we'll see smaller casts, safer numbers of people working together, um, solo shows or, or new plays written for socially distanced performing and possibly quite self-referential with little requirement to interact physically. There'll definitely be less touring within Scotland. The impact of the loss of tourism will impact on B&Bs and accommodation. Where do people stay? That's, you know, we, we've provided an enormous amount of the, tour, the accommodation economy across the country. And what kind of work will people want to see I think there will be more risk averse programming. How will the promoters be able to afford to program work that's more contemporary or experimental when they can sell fewer tickets? And they're most likely carrying the losses from the, the previous 12 to 18 months. There are some big shows that will come back. I know that the producers, particularly commercial producers are plowing on, they, they keep putting on and canceling Les Mis rehearsals, but the risks are really high. We're hoping to get some government backed insurance so that promoters can book work into the big venues across the UK, including in Scotland. But it does depend on audience confidence and the capacity that's allowed uh, in venues to make it worth their while. And also dealing with the on and off lockdowns and different local measures. Um, I did have a statistic actually, which was about um, audience returning. And I think this is relevant here that whilst 50% of the Scottish population say they're really missing going to a cultural event, 
74% say they're not in any hurry to return to going to the theatre. And for sure, there'll be more outdoor work, circus, promenade, street theatre, work in large and non-theatre spaces. There'll be more work in gardens, which would be great for Trinity, um, and outdoor stages. Holland Park and the Minac Theatre in Cornwall have, have, have both operated during lockdown when they could. Um, it's more of a challenge in Scotland <laughs> to do work outside because it's quite cold. Um, but having said that, you know, the limitations, one of the big concerns in Scotland, uh, which is it, the, where the government is imposing such a limited number of people that can attend any event is, is the public safety. It's about people traveling, people, the impact that has on the infrastructure. So um, getting permission to put work on outside is not as easy as it sounds. It it's, has big implications for gatherings of people. There will always be work online. And I think what we've learned, and this has been said, is that actually this is no longer, no, no longer an add-on. It really has become a core strand of our programme. And I think we'll be running these hybrid programmes for a very long time. As artists and producers, I think we are resilient and we're creative and we're adaptable. And if there ever was a time to be flexible and ingenious and optimistic, it, it is now. Um, and let's hope that enough of our incredible and talented workforce remain available to see this through. Thank you. Lucy, thank you so much. And there were so many ideas in there. Um, just, just the succession of lockdowns. I think we can see in all of the work we all do, um, the fact that this one has been harder perhaps to capture people's energy and to direct it and go into it one more time. Um, and you've also touched on how long will the tail be? How fast will audiences come back to traditional venues? You also touched on something which I think has come through a number of speakers, which is actually putting things online. The audience has a different attention span sitting at home. And several of you have mentioned small scale work, uh, bite sized work or smaller formats because it's more appropriate um, to watching in the informal venue of home. And it does open up opportunities too. Our last speaker is Lara Broker, and Lara is going to talk about the visual arts. Hi, um, I studied art history um, as a master's at Trinity in 1999, um, having failed to become an opera singer in Florence and having fallen in love with early Italian art. Um, I went on from Trinity to uh, train as a paintings conservator in Cambridge um, and worked as a paintings conservator for many years, but sort of gradually, I don't know how it happened, I gradually morphed into an artist and I now uh, paint using early Italian techniques um, and I'm based in France. Um, and I, I think what I'd like to say is I think visual artists are really outliers here, um, not least because many of us like nothing better than long periods of isolation. Um, and I think we're much less affected, um, obviously, than performing artists. Um, I consulted quite widely with colleagues um, prior to this, and I was quite surprised by the positivity that came across. Um, of course, there have been problems. Um, for instance, artists who use shared studio spaces can no longer access them and are having to adapt to working at home. So often on smaller scales or they're having to change their media. You can not perhaps be using toxic chemicals in your home. So you might change from oils to watercolors. Or, but artists are adaptable and, and they are adapting. Um, They've had support from governments um, in the same way as any self-employed people, and they are able to continue creating um, and actually to continue selling uh, because um, it's been a trend um, lately that uh, selling art on the internet has, has been growing enormously. And obviously there's been a boom in that since um, COVID hit. So although sales have taken a hit from exhibitions closing, uh, conversely, new channels have been opening up on the internet and buyers are getting more and more comfortable with buying even quite high value uh, things on the internet, including art. Um, so what I wanted to do was just, uh, I was going to divide the art world up into various echelons because I think they're affected quite differently. 
um, at the very top, you've got your sort of people in the stratosphere, your David Hockneys and so on, who are working with galleries in the stratosphere, like your Gagosians and White Cubes. They're really not affected at all. Um, they have their own studios, they continue working. The galleries have very strong trust relationships with their super rich clients who are used to just buying the stuff without even seeing it. So that just continues. Um, and then we have the people at the lower end of the scale, amongst which myself, who sell their work, say, below about £5,000. Uh, and we're also not too badly affected because, as I said, uh, people will buy art on the internet in that price range. Um, and although many artists have reported a slightly lower income over the last year or so, it's not a huge difference. Uh, the main problem is just uh, a lack of motivation. If you've got no exhibitions to work towards, you can start to feel a bit strange. You know, you produce these paintings and then you just put them aside and move on to the next one and no one's seen it. No one even knows you made this picture. It's, it can be a bit uh, depressing. Um, there's also an issue that many artists who sell their work in this sort of range supplement their income with classes. Um, some of those have been able to move online very successfully. Um, others, it's obviously more difficult to put online. So for some people, there have been massive opportunities, as others have said, and they've been able to find students uh, across the world who are interested in learning their techniques, uh, who they wouldn't have thought of trying to connect with before. Uh, for others, uh, they've lost that source of income for the moment. Um, then we have the artists who I think are more affected who are working at a higher range than that, say above 5,000 uh, pounds. And the problem with, for those artists is people won't buy art on the internet at those higher prices um, from a relatively unknown artist. Those artists need galleries. And we're talking here about sort of mid-range galleries. These are not well-known galleries either. And uh, the difficulty here is that galleries, like all small businesses, are suffering. Um, they, art exhibitions showing art in a gallery sort of setting online doesn't work very well. I spoke to one gallerist who said she'd had to lie down because she felt like she had vertigo after looking at her own first online exhibition, trying to navigate around it. Um, and she said uh, they're really struggling. Um, these kind of galleries don't have these long-term trust relationships with their clients. They're constantly seeking out new clients who don't know them, who therefore would like to see the work in the flesh, as it were, who want face-to-face -face meetings before they hand over what are quite large sums of money. And that kind of transaction just can't happen at the moment. Um, what's more, um, galleries need to be placed in areas where people are well off. So they often face extremely high rents. Um, and I think people often think, oh, if you work with art, these high value paintings, you must be incredibly wealthy. Of course, the gallerist themselves is probably not extremely wealthy. <laughs> they, and uh, they're facing very high rents and many of these galleries are not going to survive, uh, which means obviously there's a problem for those artists who need to sell through those galleries. Um, but uh, I suppose the positive is that uh, those galleries may close, uh, but that leaves a void, which hopefully post COVID will be filled by enthusiastic new young gallerists who will see an opportunity. So hopefully it will pick up. There may be a hiatus of a few years, but uh, hopefully the, those, that part of the uh, art world will, will pick up again. Um, I think the people who have been affected most of all are uh, students, art students. And there, uh, what's been reported to me from acquaintances is that it's a, a complete disaster. Um, I've heard from students whose courses have just been abandoned, cancelled halfway through, who got to uh, February 2020 and were told, sorry, we just can't do it online. Um, and uh, others whose courses have gone ahead are having to try to do a practical art course from their bedrooms. Um, they don't have access to the equipment that they would normally have at an art school. Um, they don't have access to the large spaces. They don't have 
uh, access to the extremely expensive, eye-wateringly expensive artists' materials that would usually be available to them. And uh, they're really struggling. Um, and it's not just equipment, it's also a large part of learning art is observing other people sparking off your fellow students and sitting in isolation in your bedroom, that's just not happening. And of course, the teachers can't properly uh, supervise the, the creative process. They can't follow the thinking and the creation um, in the way that they usually would. Um, and so that's a disaster. Of course, those students can adapt. They can use different materials. I spoke to one girl who'd been planning a series of canvas paintings, realized she couldn't afford the canvases, and so found scraps of wood in skips and painted on those instead. And she produced some, some fantastic artwork. Um, but you know, what if you're a fantastic printmaker and you just haven't discovered it yet? And you don't have access to the printmaking uh, equipment. Um, what if you actually work fantastically on a, an enormous scale, but you don't know it yet because you don't have the enormous studio in which to, to try that out? Um, so these are all opportunities being missed um, by students at the moment. Um, so uh, a lot of those students are dropping out um, and a lot of those students who could have gone on to have fantastic careers in art won't. Um, so overall, I think what I wanted to say is the picture's not too bad for visual artists as a group. And um, post COVID, I think there's no reason why things shouldn't return to an in inverted commas normal with added internet. Um, so perhaps even more sales and teaching opportunities for up and coming artists. Um, and I think that uh, although some people, these uh, some individuals, some gallery owners, some students and so on, it's a personal tragedy for those people. I think that the art world will pick up. Um, and I think that uh, having spoken to, to my colleagues, I think we can look forward to a flurry of exhibitions as soon as COVID is over because everybody's champing at the bit, wanting to reveal their paintings that they've been stockpiling for the last two years. Mara, thank you. A mixed picture there, um, and perhaps an industry that can recover more swiftly. Um, th there are a number of uh, questions and comments online, uh, comments about uh, philanthropy and how do we reverse the picture that John talked about. I think that's a seminar in its own right in terms of how to change uh, legacies to animals, pets and um, health uh, to put the arts higher up. Hilary, I want to ask you a question. In Germany, um, you've described it as a rather more conservative audience, maybe traditional large-scale theatres, very much embedded in their communities. Um, how fast do you think people will return to 2,000-seat theatres or even 1,000-seat theatres? Well, uh, it's interesting you should say that because I was, um, I was um, uh, also interested in what Lucy said about having a more ecological uh, side so the performance is not jetting all around the world and everywhere because the form of the German city theatre was so that the people in the theatre lived and worked in the community. The orchestra, the singers, the chorus, everybody would be, everybody would know them. Uh, I remember when I first came to Germany, my wife was a singer and she would go into a department store and the girl behind the counter would say, oh, didn't I see you in Cozy Fantudi last night? Or the guy driving the taxi. It was, it was a very, very, um, everybody went to the theatre. Now this has changed over the world. It's become a little more elitist. It's become more of a niche uh, thing. Um, I think there's a great wish to get back to the theater in Germany. And they, they rely on it in, 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 a, in, a, in a way. This, it's, as I said, it's such a basis of their whole culture. Um, we'll see, as all you can say, we're all just waiting. We're on tenterhooks waiting to see exactly what will happen. Thank you. Lucy, what's the picture in Scotland there? Um, 
Yeah, well, everything's closed. I mean, as I said, there was this little window um, when areas in the highlands and the islands were able to open, but um, that's all changed again now. But I think there was um, what what remains completely unknown. Um, but, but based on that little window of opening, was that this capacity uh, maximum has been set, so that regardless of the scale of your venue, um, certainly when that window was there, that those venues in that level the capacity threshold was 100. So, I mean, there are some venues in Scotland which don't even seat that, you know, little rural community venues. Um, but if you're a, a thousand seater venue in, Ab in, um, in Inverness, that, that was, you know, that's just not viable financially with, you know, the, so, so, so I think what we've been looking at is how to create a proportionate way of setting an auditoria maximum that is related to your footprint as a as a venue and knowing that the, the real concern is around the circulation of people both inside and outside a venue uh, I think this this concern is around the kind of travel infrastructure and how people get to and from the space what their what the situation is when they're queuing making sure that that kind of management of the public in groups is is well thought through um, so so that's our push as a, as a federation working with the Scottish government is to try to create a, a means of of leaving this the, on the basis that we do manage the, the public very safely. You know, we're a very safety conscious industry, um, but we need to be given the opportunity to set our own maximums uh, from a safety point of view. Um, obviously the, the finances of that then would have to be figured out, but. Um, Presumably if um, when the vaccination has much greater cover, do you sense a hunger from audiences to come back? Or do you sense there will still be a reticence? I, I think there's a reticence. I, I mean, I think a lot of our venues and our companies play to quite young audiences, which will, you know, will probably be the last to be vaccinated. Um, if the fringe, the festivals, the summer festivals in Edinburgh are really questioning the viability at the moment. And I think they're being very cautious about it. I suspect the decision that they take will be a bit of a marker in the sand. Um, but at the moment, the indication in that survey that I quoted really indicates that the, the expectation is of caution. The audiences are not looking forward to it. That the, the, the prospect of being, even with the vaccination, being in an enclosed space with a lot of people you don't know in close proximity is, is not what we've got used to now. We all navigate around each other and, and that's really difficult to ask people to do that. Um, and obviously that doesn't take into account what has to happen backstage, you know, in terms of social distancing and actually how, how you work in the box and all of those things are logistically quite difficult. So um, I'm, I'm cautious. I think people at venues are, are, are planning at best a Christmas show is the first thing they do and probably really thinking of spring next year. So that's crippling. Um, yeah. For, yeah. Michael, you talked a little bit about you had your um, your list of productions and ideas that you were ready to um, bring out at the end of this. Are they? Do you think that um, they will include different sorts of work because of this perhaps hiatus that will go on longer with the pandemic beyond when we're vaccinated? You know, one, one of the most fascinating aspects of this situation is that, for example, the relationship between a stage director and a set designer becomes totally different because you have to design space with social distancing in mind. So um, uh, you have to think um, like your, your self-development becomes the positive thing coming out of all this because you have to rethink your decisions because as Lucy was saying uh, the rules have changed and uh, this you know you, you want to carry on with the productions you want to be on the runway ready to go but the use of the space the um, basically the craft of blocking will will change the handling of the props as Lucy was saying I mean it was I was just terrified when I heard you say that because how do you create the momentum during the creative process? But I think we'll just have to re relearn the new rules and generate energy, creative energy differently. That's what I think. Thank you. Um, I've got a very interesting comment, comment and uh, question from Alan Reid. Alan, do you want to 
pop your mic on and, and introduce this idea. Uh, hi, thanks very much and great to be with you. I'm an outsider. Um, and I was fascinated that alumni of Trinity were getting together. And I'm understanding, am I right, that most of the speakers were connected to Trinity in some way. And I was thinking from the perspective of a university base in the heart of Theatreland, right on Aldwych, that owns an enormous amount of land, gifted to it, of course, by George IV in 1829. It is an extraordinary privilege to work in a university at this moment. And during the last year, I've been incredibly conscious of a revolution that needs to take place in our campuses with regards to the commitment to the arts. And we really have to step up and think about what we have to offer. And the question I've put into the sort of sidebar there is to ask anyone participating, if you've got examples of really strong, innovative, strategic thinking during the pandemic that's come from a university, not with regard to immunization, vaccination, that Oxford does very well, that King's has done very well, but in the area of culture, cultural innovation, because I really do think we're asking at King's for the West End effectively to open up its spaces 24 seven, more or less. It's extraordinary we've got dark theatres continuously at a time when spaces are so desperately needed. And so I'm really interested in the policy for the future about how we make the best use of our resources. And I think that relates to what um, John was referring to earlier with regards to ways of thinking ourselves out of this and into the future. And it really has been a wake up call. So my question is lying there really for anybody who's got time later to come back to it. And that's to drop me a line if you've got very interesting examples of universities, campuses or others, not necessarily Oxford, who've really stepped up in this dimension and would perhaps like to contribute to the kind of work I'm trying to organize through the Performance Foundation at King's, which is saying, what role are we really going to play now? My God, you know, theaters around the country as vaccination centers, people distributing food at Slunglow, at the Beeston Working Men's Club, just outside Yorkshire, the extraordinary Alan Lane, who was just honored in the New Year's Honours list, turning their theater into a food distribution plant. There is so much for us to do. And I've been absolutely invigorated by the contributions, particularly from the early career people talking here. So thank you for allowing me in. Thanks. Great pleasure. John, you want to come back on that? Yes, but I can't resist, Alan, to tell you that King's College London has been actually what we, with the City of London Symphony, my orchestra, we, we have got a group, a research group from you guys working on trying to find KFIs, trying to find that sort of alchemist gold of the proof between um, sort of music and therapy. Uh, mental wellness, we do a huge, we are the, probably the biggest ones in working with the Bethlehem and the Maudsley and sort of in mental wellness, et cetera. And it is King's College London who have actually sort of made money available so that we can have a research little team working with us to try to, you know, because governments just turn up their noses and they say, well, yeah, we see it empirically, give us the hard data. So actually, I, I'm happy to say that, that you guys have been sort of working with us through the <laughs> pandemic and actually really trying to, to unlock that, that sort of door. Which John, John, I'm, John, I'm, I'm very relieved. I'm very relieved we've actually contributed a bit there. And I really would welcome anybody being in contact who might have good examples of this happening elsewhere. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Tristan, do you want to ask your question? The second one you've put up. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, John, this kind of relates to what you spoke about in your talk. Um, and it's how likely do you think it is that the arts will actually be revolutionized and sort of really change in the way that you were saying post COVID. Um, and do you think that the technologies that we've got used to now, like virtual concerts and greater online presence are gonna play a huge part in that? Um, and that sort of second one segues into a kind of third question of, might we end up like uh, with a subscription based arts industry? And I've put like Sky Sports, but with the arts where you have sort of almost 24 seven concerts um, or replays um throughout the day on a sort of subscription channel and then like maybe um certain orchestras performing in the evenings that kind of thing well i'll, I'll let others sort of join in this as well but actually I, I i am as you'd expect sort of quite optimistic and because you know i, I say we've got this horrific i mean it's 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 it is it's like the battle of the song at the moment and, and the descriptions we've had of you know people leaving um the arts i mean it, it is absolutely heartbreaking and and you know venues sort of, uh, you know, certain ones are getting their crisis money, like O2, uh, you know, sort of getting sort of quite large chunks. 
and the smaller ones are not. And so, the, but this, I think a lot of people have spoken about the, the sort of positives of smaller. So, you know, just like we, you know, with my orchestras, we're going to sort of really go into smaller ensembles like the National Youth Orchestra and not just 164 people on the stage in smaller venues, going into local, someone has mentioned, you know, instead of going into international, you know, ritzy glitzy uh, touring, actually getting out into the local community and actually really making a difference there. But that's what the Arts Council wants. That's what their 10 year strategy is all about. I think they would have had great difficulty. There was sort of, that was really one that was sort of, there was a certain resistance. And now I think this is a positive that comes out. And you just hinting at, yes, sort of sky models and what have you. I think this is where we all, you know, and I'll let others um, come in, where, where, where I was talking about in terms of new, just not just the, the sort of operational model, uh, small as ensembles, et cetera, or the way that we interact with our audiences, um, but that has to sort of work into strategic and financial models as well to make it possible. And that may be indeed, you don't want to sell out. That's the thing about Sky, what have you. You don't want to sell out. Um, and, uh, um, you know, and that's even with individuals. You're finding here that sort of what um, is happening in America for a decade, which is if you say, I'll give you money, but I want to be at the table. And I find on all my boards that I'm a stage where they say that we rather don't accept the money. Uh, we are not going to allow our arts to be contaminated uh, and take the devil's uh, shilling. So I think, yeah, we all have to think in a very positive way, but I am very sure there are so many people who want the survival of the arts and there's so many capable of giving it. We are just going to go through the battle of Somme. It's going to be a horrific sort of World War I scenario. Uh, I am an optimist that we'll come out with different models that will actually be of much more relevance to a much larger section of, of the community. Um, you know, we'll smash John, in many ways, John, in many ways, you can see that happening more readily outside London in the UK um, and outside major population centres. You can see it more in regional art setups, um, national, Scottish, Welsh setups. Um, but certainly in some of the cities outside London, where rather like Germany, Michael, many of the arts, large infra arts infrastructure is very knitted into its community. Um, I guess finding the business models to sustain it is a very mixed economy to do that. Um, a comment from Derek uh, saying how many of us have felt deprived of live arts concerts and theatre, is there any substitute for live work? Um, we'll all have our own views. My view is I can't wait to get back into an auditorium and sit in an audience and listen to live music because I miss, I wholly miss it digitally. Um, it's not the same experience and it's that collective experience for me personally, which makes me want to spend money on a ticket, want to go and hear something live and feel I sat in a in a large or indeed a small auditorium with people who are passionate about it. Michael Papadopoulos, um, you're the rising generation. Um, tell us your hopes. Oh, wow. Um, I hope that, I guess, because so many arts organizations and individuals have been forced to communicate their music making through streaming, through online, that actually the wider audience they will have reached. And I think it is a significantly wider audience than they would have reached through live performance. I mean, I, I know examples of some organizations who uh, have had uh, recordings during lockdown put on sort of Classic FM. And, you know, when you can see the number of people that have seen these videos on Facebook or whatever, it's absolutely astonishing. It's, it's completely, uh, you know, gulfs the you know even 2,000 people in a packed concert hall um, and I'm, my hope is that because of the sort of innovative programming that I sort of mentioned and also the wider reach of people that have that classical music has, has reached uh, during this time uh, that actually we're, we're beginning to grow a new audience especially in this country classical music uh, tends to be sort of the preserve of the of a more older aging population and I'm, I'm hoping that the sort of innovations that we've been forced to undertake during this time will have begun the slow process of sort of expanding uh, the reach of classical music to a, a more broad audience. That's my sort of long-term hope. 
Mary Janet, a performer. Final sentence from me. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm very a bit much with Michael there. Um, I think we hope that individually, musicians will be able to overcome all the, the different problems which we're having at the moment, particularly with mental health, and be able to kind of get back into a place where we can take advantage of all the opportunities which I'm sure will come after the pandemic. Lara? Well, I was just going to say I wanted to tell people about a colleague of mine, uh, slightly younger than me, who's completely embraced all the technology during this period. She's sort of moved her art making online and she's just discovering a whole new world. She makes a TikTok video every day and paints live online. She has 11,000 people following her who make donations to her while she paints. She says small donations, but it all adds up. She uh, stopped uh, doing so much actual uh, sort of physical painting as it were and started doing digital portraits. She now has more commissions than she can deal with and uh, she's, she's, business is booming for her so, and creativity is booming. So I think for those who can and, and who want to go in that direction, there are huge opportunities. And um, as people have been saying, it's very democratizing. Thank you so much. I'd love to go around absolutely everyone and ask for a final statement, but we've exceeded our time and I don't want us to overstay our welcome. But I just want to close by saying how wonderful it's been to reconnect with so many Trinity um, old members or alumni, whichever you like to call it, um, who have careers in the arts and the creative industries uh, right across a broad spectrum. It's really heartening to meet some of you for the first time, to reconnect with others. And of course, one of the great things we've learned through this is we can connect so much better with our alumni through sessions like this online. Um, it's been terrific to uh, welcome so many people back today, either members of Trinity or guests who've joined. Um, and just to say, um, having said that it's easier to connect uh, online, we actually can't wait to welcome you back to college in the flesh. Uh, it's, it's a lovely experience meeting in Zoom, but it doesn't replace the live experience. And uh, we really do look forward to finding a way to bring you back to college. Just to let you know, um, we have a quarter of our students here this, this term, most of them graduates, a very small number of undergraduates. And um, we miss them terribly. Uh, we miss that noisy community and lively community um, and we do hope that we're going to be back in college with the whole community again as we were in Michaelmas term back on site um, and uh, trying to recreate and pick up from where we truly left off um, exactly a year ago in Hillary term it's the last time we've had a normal term so it's lovely to see you Thank you so much for your engagement, your interest, and for sharing your knowledge. And one of the things I'm determined to do is we will do some kind of arts gaudy uh, when we're in a position to, to help you connect with each other face-to-face -face and many others. Um, Anna, next week we have another session. Just tell me what the subject is. The, the future of higher education. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Alan, you, you're welcome to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks to Anna and to Thank Sarah you. for organising this. And uh, lovely to see you. Do take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.